Beginning in the spring of 1942, German U-boats attacked American civilian freighters and tankers in the Gulf of Mexico, often within sight of unsuspecting coastal cities and towns in Texas, Florida, and Louisiana. Unprepared for a war that had quickly reached their own shores, American naval and Coast Guard forces sank only one U-boat in the Gulf. A year later, the U-boats were gone, but they left behind the wrecks of 56 American ships. More than 60 years later, a team of archaeologists, biologists, and media professionals journeyed out into the Gulf to study this deadly legacy for the positive purposes of science. Using modern underwater technology, this expert team analyzed six of the wrecks to better understand how time and the natural workings of the sea had transformed sunken metal ships into thriving artificial reefs. Exploring these shattered vessels in depths ranging from 280 to 6,500 feet, this group of government, university, and private industry specialists discovered in this former battlefield a rich underwater laboratory. The U-166 and the Robert E. Lee are perhaps the best known of the six ships visited during the Deep Gulf Rex mission. Their story continues to fascinate historians, submariners, and archaeologists more than 60 years after they met their violent ends. On July 30, 1942, the aging passenger steamer Robert E. Lee, transporting construction workers, cargo, and some survivors from torpedoed ships, headed to Tampa from Trinidad. Unable to land in Tampa, the ship continued on towards New Orleans with the PC-566, a Navy patrol ship, as an escort. Lurking in nearby waters was the German U-boat, the U-166, a long-range Class 9C vessel which had just completed its mission of laying mines near the mouth of the Mississippi River. Captained by Hans Gunter Kuhlmann, the U-166 had already sunk three ships before entering the Gulf of Mexico. Unaware of one another, the two ships sailed into the Mississippi Canyon area of the Gulf. The U-166 spotted the freighter and fired a torpedo towards it with deadly accuracy. Within 10 minutes, the Robert E. Lee had disappeared beneath the waves. The crew of the PC-566 quickly dropped depth charges in the area. Since they did not see any debris from the U-boat, they were not sure if the depth charges had found their target. Two days after the sinking of the Robert E. Lee, a Coast Guard plane patrolling approximately 138 miles to the east spotted a U-boat on the surface. Henry White piloted the plane and George Boggs Jr. was the radio man. Quickly diving towards the ship, the plane released a depth charge that hit the water as the U-boat submerged to escape the attack. Seeing an oil slick on the water, the two airmen believed they had sunk the U-boat. The German U-boat command unsuccessfully attempted to contact the U-166. After several months without any communication from the ship, the U-boat was officially listed as missing. Finally, the Germans declared the U-166 and its 52 crewmen lost. With no other U-boats missing in the Gulf, authorities were certain that White and Boggs had attacked and sunk the U-166. No one, however, was able to find the wreck. Of the 24 U-boats that wreaked havoc off the Gulf Coast, the U-166 was the only one to be lost in the Gulf of Mexico. For the next 59 years, historians, mariners, and archaeologists all looked for the U-boat without success. In 2001, an oil and gas surveying expedition using sophisticated underwater equipment recorded the image of a wreck in 5,000 feet of water. The researchers had expected to find the Alcoa Puritan, which was later located in shallower waters to the west. The dimensions on the image, showing a ship with its bow separated from its stern, led to a surprising conclusion. The oil companies agreed uh, to have us uh, conduct an investigation around the Robert E. Lee and also the reported location of the uh, Alcoa. When we got that data back, however, as Dan and I were, were looking through the data, we realized that that the image of the, uh, of the vessel at the location where the Alcoa was supposed to be did not match a 7,000 ton cargo freighter, but rather it matched up with the dimensions of a Class 9C German U-boat. Since only one U-boat had been lost in the Gulf, this wreck must be the elusive U-166. But that ship had supposedly gone down more than 100 miles in a different direction. I walked into Rob's office and I told him, I said, I said what if the patrol craft, the PC-566, sank the U-166, and White and Boggs bombed another U-boat. Rob kind of leaned back in his chair and said, you know, that's the interesting what if. So I began uh, researching what other U-boats uh, were available in the Gulf, 
that could have been bombed by the Coast Guard. And I was able to find out that U-171 was actually in the right area. And there's actually a vague reference in their logs that uh, does match up with the story of a, of a flying boat or a seaplane dropping a depth charge on them and them escaping with, with no damage. This led us to um, doing some more detailed surveys with the AEV uh, once we had put together uh, our argument that this could be the U-166. Data that we collected was very compelling supporting the U-boat hypothesis. We then went out and ground truth the U-boat uh, and uh, it turned out that, that we had indeed found the U-166. Later missions confirmed the identity of the wreck. The resting place of the U-166 had finally been located. Today, like the other ships studied on the mission, both the Robert E. Lee and the U-166 support a variety of marine life. The Robert E. Lee is covered with fish, plants, and those unique bacteria-related growths called rusticles. Although smaller in size, the U-166 is also home to a variety of plants and fish. After the fury of their violent ends, the U-166 and the Robert E. Lee now lie quietly a mile apart from one another. While both ships are wartime grave sites, they are now also part of new life beneath the sea.